Falmouth Conservation Commission. This meeting is being held virtually via Zoom video conference. Please be patient. We will do our best to be efficient and allow everyone to participate equitably. This meeting is also being broadcast and streamed online by FCTV in real time. As this meeting is being recorded by Zoom and broadcast by FCTV, Please be aware of what you say, how you say it, and what can be seen and heard in your background. The chair acknowledges the assistance and continued support of our entire staff, Jen, Kevin, Alyssa, Mark, and Amy. And we welcome our new recording secretary, Kristen Patnod. Welcome, Kristen. Uh, tonight, we are missing two commissioners. I'm sorry, we're missing one commissioner. We have a full compliment. Uh, let's see. I'd like to remind you guys that for commenting, I'll call on each of you at the appropriate time so we can refrain from speaking over each other. Also that all votes will be done by roll call. When I call your name, please state your name and your vote. And though it may be redundant, even if you were the one who made the motion or the second, I'm still gonna call for your vote. To our public participants, at any time during this meeting, you may enter any comments or questions via the chat function. At the appropriate time, they will be read into the record. The link and further instructions are located on the agenda. As per chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 regard, regarding COVID-19 now allows for full public participation. So if you'd like to be heard on a specific hearing, let us know via the chat function. Then at the appropriate time, I will call for public comment. When you are selected, you will be moved into the hearing as a participant. As such, you must have your video enabled, be succinct and respectful of others. Public comments will be limited to three minutes each. First up, requests for determination of applicability. 267 Clinton Ave, LLC, 267 Clinton Ave, Falmouth, Mass. Full permission to upgrade and maintain an on site sewage disposal system. Mr. Newton. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is requesting a continuance until September 13th. Heard, so move. Glad to second. September right. 15th, Kevin? They had asked for September 13th. Let me see what that date is. It's a Monday, so I'm assuming they mean the 13th. 15th. Yeah, 15th. All right, we have a motion and a second to continue this till September 15th. Betsy? Glad well, filter aye. Courtney? Heard aye. Matthews aye. Kevin? O'Brien aye. Pat? Harris, I. Peter? Walsh, I. Steve? Pat, and I. It is unanimous. We have continued this until September 15th. Next up, Leonard Remia, 11 a Avenue A, East Falmouth, Mass. For permission to construct and maintain additions and a covered front porch and to remove an existing driveway. Mr. Newton? Yes, Mr. Chairman, staff recommends a negative two under the state and under the bylaw. Resource area boundaries are not confirmed. All right, so move. Black filter, second. All right, we have a motion and a second to accept staff's recommendation. Betsy. Black filter, aye. Courtney. All right, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Matt and I. It is unanimous. We have accepted staff's recommendation. Next up, Deborah Smith Nez, 26 Associates Road, West Falmouth, Mass. For permission to rebuild and repair beach access stairs and to install a safety railing. Mr. Newton. Mr. Chairman, staff recommends a negative two under the state and negative three under the bylaw. Resource area boundaries are not confirmed. Heard, so move. Glad Poulter, second. We have a motion and a second to accept staff's recommendation. Pepsi. 
Glad filter aye. Courtney. Heard aye. Matthews aye. Kevin. O'Brien aye. Pat. Harris aye. Peter. Walsh aye. Steve. Pat and aye. It is unanimous. We have accepted staff's recommendation. Next up, our investments, LLC, 324 and 330 Central Avenue, East Falmouth Pass, for permission to construct a single family dwelling and to install a Title V septic system with all associated clearing, grading, and landscaping. Mr. Newton. Mr. Chairman, staff recommends a negative two under the state and under the bylaw. Resource area boundaries are not confirmed. Heard so move. And I have a question. I assume this is floodplain, a flood zone? Yes, sir. There's a limit of work. Um, I believe it's about five feet landward of the salt marsh buffer zone. So it's within flood zone only. Glad filter I. All right, we have a motion and a second to accept I mean, staff's recommendation. Any other questions? Glad filter second. <laughs> yes. I got that. All right, Betsy. Now glad filter I. Now the I. Courtney. Heard I. Matthews I. Kevin. O'Brien I. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Pat and I. It is unanimous. We have accepted staff's recommendation. Next up, Vicente Del Gaudio, 66 Chester Street, Falmouth, Mass, for permission to Vista prune according to FWR 10.1810B. Mr. Newton. Yes, Mr. Chairman, staff recommends a negative two under the state and a negative three under the bylaw. Resource area boundaries are not confirmed. Heard, so move. Glad filter second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to accept staff's recommendation. Betsy? Glad filter aye. Courtney? Heard aye. Matthews aye. Kevin? O'Brien aye. Pat? Harris aye. Peter? Walsh aye. Steve? Patton, aye. It is unanimous. We have accepted staff's recommendation. Next up is continued request for determination of applicability. Jill Neubauer Architects, 10 Langley Road, Falmouth, Mass. For permission to construct a single family dwelling and install a Title V septic system on an undeveloped wooded lot. Mr. Newton. Yes, Mr. Chairman, staff is uh, maintaining our recommendation of a positive three under the state and under the bylaw. If you remember, um, the commission had wanted an opportunity to take a look at this property and I had forwarded to the commission the sets of plans. Mr. Chairman, I've promoted Tom Bunker up as um, to answer any of the board's questions, um, basically because this is being constructed on a coastal bank um staff just felt that we had no choice but to recommend the positive all right mr bunker do you have anything you'd like to add um no i, under, I understand the the situation and all it is on a coastal bank it's on a coastal bank that's uh, quite distant from the ocean other resource areas uh very minimally a coastal bank and i just didn't feel it would have any any negative impact uh, on, on uh, resource areas to, to allow this work. But of course, the point of this continuance was for some of you to go out and take a look at it. And if you agree with the uh, staff recommendation, then, um, then, then that's what it'll be. All right, thank you. So the, the staff's recommendation is a positive three. I'll entertain Correct. a motion. Anybody? So, all right, I'll make a motion that uh, uh, to accept staff's recommendation that a, of a positive determination. Okay. And I'll make a second, but I'm not gonna vote for it. Okay, so the motion and the second are on the table to accept staff's recommendation of a positive three. It's just so we're all clear. Betsy. Uh, can we have a discussion first? Sure. Okay, I understand why staff recommended this, but if anybody went out to the 
site. This is this is not a site where any building activity is going to have any effect on on our resources other than this coastal bank, which I mean, it's surrounded by roads and houses and forests, etc. So I don't think this requires an NOI. So that's that's why I made the comment that I did. Okay. Anybody else have anything? All right. So again, the, the motion on the table is to accept staff's recommendation of a positive three. All right, I'm taking the vote. Betsy? No. Courtney? Bird, no. Matthews, no. Kevin? O'Brien, no. Pat? Harris, no. Peter? Walsh, no. Steve? Steve, you're on mute. <laughs> Still on mute. Yeah. There you are. No. <laughs> All right. So it is unanimous. We have rejected staff's recommendation. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do me a favor. Somebody make a motion just for a negative two so it's on the record because there's just different negatives. So. I'll make also move that um, uh, we have a negative determination on this RDA application. Thank you. Glad to a second. All right. Our new vote, the motion and the second on the table is for um, a negative two determination, or at least a negative determination. Betsy. Glad to aye. Courtney. Third aye. Matthews aye. Kevin. O'Brien aye. Pat. Harris aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Pat and I. All right. So it is unanimous um, that we have issued a negative determination. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Tom, it was a compelling argument. Tom, are you are you leaving us tonight or do you need to go back into attendees? I think I'm leaving you. I'm okay, leaving then you have a good table. night, Tom. He's yeah. gonna go get his pizza. Yes, hey, my pizza. No, pizza. a home cooked meal tonight. Whoa, good. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much. Good night, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Good night. All right. So at the risk of confusing everyone, um, Jack Vaccaro, who's going to be the main presenter for Woods Hole, which is the next notice. And yes, I'm going to do all the legalese. Bear with me. Um, he's been kind enough to allow us. We're going to we're going to table that and move two other things ahead of it so that those people don't have to wait until 11 o'clock tonight. So, Jack, if you're listening, thank you. So the legalese. All hearings of the Falmouth Conservation Commission are held simultaneously under the authorities of the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Falmouth Wetlands Bylaw. Although a single decision of the commission is issued, it represents a separate decision <clears throat> under each authority. So I'm looking for a motion in a second to table 86 Water Street temporarily. Heard, so move. Well, I felt her second. Okay. So your motion is second to table 86 Water Street. Betsy? Well, I felt her aye. Courtney? Third aye. Matthews aye. Kevin? O'Brien aye. Pat? Harris aye. Peter? Walsh aye. Steve? Aye. All right. It is unanimous. We have temporarily tabled 86 Water Street. Therefore, we move on to continued hearings under notice of intent. First up, Robert B. and Elaine M. Bailey, trustees, the Elaine M. Bailey 2013 Revocable Trust, 132 Little Neck Bars Road, West Falmouth, Mass., for permission to conduct invasive species management, install restoration plantings, and to construct a patio front walkway and increase the size of the driveway. Jen? Yes, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is requesting one last continuance until September 15th. And before you ask, Courtney, we spoke with Jen Crawford today. We have um, resolved most of the staffs, if not all of the staffs, 
concerns in our original staff report. She's revising the plan and will be ready to present it to the commission on the 15th. So, so moved, Gladfelter. Second, Bird second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to continue this hearing until 9.15. Betsy. Gladfelter, aye. Courtney. Bird, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Pat and aye. It is unanimous. We have continued this until 9.15. Next up, Carol Efron Flyer, 55, Moon Penny Lane, East Falmouth, Mass, for permission to conduct hardscape and landscape improvements and to install mitigation plantings. Jen. Mr. Chairman, I have promoted Matt Costa and Christopher Buccino up to present their project. Thank you, Mr. Costa. You're up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for let us, uh, letting us sneak in here. Uh, thanks to uh, Jack Ricaro as well. Uh, we'll try to be quick. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yes, sir. So um, we're here tonight uh, under a notice of intent application from a property located at 55 uh, Moon Penny. Lane, I got it pulled up on the screen here. You can see, uh, hopefully everybody can see uh, the GIS uh, aerial for the site. Um, the, so uh, for this site here, your resource areas include uh, land under uh, the ocean, land containing shellfish. Uh, we have salt marsh area. We have coastal beach, uh, then coastal bank and then uh, land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, some of you may remember this site. Um, it was before the board last year under a RDA application to rebuild this existing deck in the back. Uh, we're here tonight uh, requesting uh, an order of conditions for work uh, related to uh, some landscaping activities um, that include uh, Bear with me a second and get the plan in the right place for you. That include rebuilding a walkway here on the north side of the house, uh, a new patio, uh, removing a cedar tree, um, reconfiguring some stairs in the outdoor shower uh, in this area, and then reconfiguring uh, landscaping, uh, both ornamental uh, beds and lawn area. Uh, along the back portion of the property. Uh, additionally, we are proposing a four foot high aluminum fence in the front uh, for a fenced in uh, dog area. Um, <clears throat> this project is located within your buffer zones, uh, A and B, and requires mitigation. And we uh, showed the buffer zone uh, calculations on the plan, the mitigation calculations. Uh, that were used to calculate the mitigation areas. And we show the proposed plant list uh, along with the um, light tolerances for the plants um, that are gonna be used as a mix uh, in these green mitigation areas that you see. Um, Chris uh, Buccino, who's with me tonight is the landscape architect on the project. Uh, he worked with uh, the applicants to develop a landscape plan for this site uh, that took into account um, both the uh, existing conditions and um, the proposed improvements. Uh, one of the things that, um, well, we worked with staff who uh, was great in working with us and we believe we addressed uh, all of their questions. Um, they do have a standing recommendation that this area in the back here, this area of Rosa Ragosa uh, is to remain. Um, this is in a uh, proposed lawn area uh, and we're proposing to remove it. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to show you a picture of these plants. Um, what we have is uh, existing uh, Rosa Ragosa um, that we believe is part of uh, the ornamental planting scheme. And you can see in here, 
Uh, there's actually some buried in there. There's some hydrangea plants uh, along with some other weeds. It's really been unkept. Uh, and then there's some bare ground area behind it. And if you look uh, back on the area, you can see, um, <clears throat> pardon me, wrong one. And Zoom keeps getting in the way. So let me, the right one. This is the area that we're talking about here. And this photo was taken according to the GIS uh, as a 2020 aerial. Um, and it's winter time, obviously. So you can see in this area, it looks, it looks like a bed. Um, it, these uh, Rosa rugosa are not native and they're mixed in with some other ornamentals. So uh, we do believe that that was uh, at one time uh, ornamental plantings. Then reconfiguring this lawn area and the ornamental beds and then incorporating the mitigation the result was a, a net environmental benefit by way of increasing the overall uh, native species that will be on the site and reducing the lawn area uh, by up to 400 uh, square feet. So um, we believe this project does meet all the applicable performance standards as we articulated in our narrative and we are respectfully requesting you issue an order of conditions. Um, Chris and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Matt. All right, Jen, do you want to start? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Just looking up something real quick. Um. So um, I guess I'll start with the Rosa Rugosa. Matt, you said you had incorporated it into your mitigation scheme, but when we spoke on the phone today, you said it wasn't incorporated. So yes, you are planting native species, but those are required for the increase in impervious surface. Um, I think I, I get the hydrangeas in there, but that's, you know, that's a, you know, we have other pictures of the, um, Rosa Rugosa that is in the zone A of the salt marsh. And um, we would recommend if the board did allow that to be removed, then that plant volume be replaced and not just turned into lawn. Because the way the calculations read is you are required to put, I think, 2,351 uh, square feet of mitigation plantings for the increase in the patio and everything. And that's exactly what you have. So you're not incorporating that or not counting the removal of that Rosa Rugosa. Um, uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke, but I, I didn't intend to say that we were incorporating okay. Rosa Rugosa. I meant we were incorporating mitigation plantings in the overall scheme for realigning beds and lawn areas. So okay. sorry, no, that's fine. sorry about that. Um, sorry, I'm just having a changing my view here gallery i don't know why this is going oh, there we go now i can see everybody um so i mean staff would recommend if the board did allow them to remove that area of vegetation in that zone a no disturbance zone that it be replaced somewhere else on the property just to let the uh commission know we did ask or we were concerned where the mitigation was being planted on kind of the eastern southeastern side of the property um, and which is why they provided the, the shade tolerance for the plants, because it is pretty shady if you've been on the site down in that area. So that's why we requested that information. Um, I guess my next question, Chris, it's for you. Hi. Um, we're kind of concerned about the patio and damaging the root systems of that oak. Can you tell me how the patio is going to be constructed to not damage that tree? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Chris Buccino. I'm a landscape architect here in Falmouth. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I um, submitted a, a memo as part of the, the record for this project or the NOI, NOI record to okay. Matt Costa, uh, which I believe he submitted to you, um, Jen, and um, uh, included in that memo, I, I show a construction protocol or a detail for that mm -hmm. patio, which uh, yes, correct. Um, so what we're proposing 
is um, to use um, air spade or an air, a similar air excavation type tool that an arborist would use to tease out um, the existing soil around that existing oak tree so that we can replace that soil with a, with a sand-based structural soil growing media, which would be um, suitable for, um, for, for the oak tree and allows us to then um, install um, a very thin layer of a dense graded crushed stone and stone pavers on top of that sand-based structural soil base. So um, we're maintaining the, you know, a, a soil growing media for the tree and likely it would be uh, an improved um, kind of growing media for that existing tree than what is there today, um, while allowing for the patio to be placed in proximity to the oak tree. So that detail and that um, protocol is, in, is included in the NOI record. Um, mm -hmm. And just another point about the, um, Jennifer, does that answer your question? For the it, it does, I have a follow-up question when you're done. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, just how far is that patio from the base of that tree right now? How well proposed? Matt, do you happen to have that number? Yes. If it's you know four or five feet. Okay. Somewhere on three sides. And I think in terms of that the construction, there's also you know the ability to be able to taper the the profile um, of that growing media or the mm -hmm. sand-based structural soil and the patio as we approach you know closer in proximity to the to the trunk of the tree um, but i mean i mean yeah so you it looks like um just from a plan view like the plan it's like a, a five foot you know a five foot kind of cut out around that tree mm -hmm. so i i think about me i'm like five five six like to be Actually, I'm five five. I like to be five six. I'm only five five. Um, is, yeah, that, is that, you think it would be enough five. room for the tree to grow? Mm. The trees grow. We know that, so um, it's not going to inhibit the growth of the tree at all. It, not in my opinion. No. Okay. No. Okay. So that was one thing. Thank you. That was just one thing that the the staff was concerned about, and not. Just out of curiosity, picket fence for the dog. Uh, it's not going to be. It's not going to be a, a split rail. Four so foot like high a, uh, aluminum fence. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. And I think. Um, oh, the only thing uh, is, where is that second holly tree going to be planted? It's right over with the other two. It'll be all, all right. on that side. Okay. Those are my only questions, unless Mr. Newton has anything to add. I do not at this time. Thank you. All right, we're going to open up to commissioner comments. Betsy, we'll start with you. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I just agree with Jen about uh, replacing the, I, I don't mind removing the Rosa Ragosa and other whatever other plants that are there, but replacing that square footage somewhere with the rest of the mitigation with native plants. That's all. Thanks, Jamie. All right. Courtney. Uh, I have nothing to add to Betsy's comments. I agree. Okay. Kevin. No comments, Mr. Chairman. All right. Pat. No questions. Thank you. Peter? No questions, thank you. Steve? No questions, thank you. All right. Jen, is there anything in the um, public chat function? No, Mr. Chairman, there is not. Thank you. Oh, right. I think Wait Chris has his hand raised again. Um, yeah, yeah, just one quick point, if if I or, or a question uh, regarding the Ragosa Rose, um, 
would you allow us to transplant those Rigosa rows to an adjacent planting area where we're removed, where we're proposing to remove existing lawn? So essentially we're just, um, you know, shifting the Rigosa rows from one area to an adjacent planting area that is not, you know, mitigation planting. It's proposed new uh, planting area. Where is that new planting area, Chris? Uh, it's uh, between the proposed lawn and the deck. So we're, we're reducing the overall lawn area and proposing to expand. Uh, I think it's labeled as ornamental planting area on the plan, Matt, I believe. But it's a net, you know, we're increasing the planting area there. And, you know, so we could transplant all of the Rugosa rows, you know, to within. So you put it right up against the deck. And that's going to be up to the commission. They usually don't like their mitigation or restoration plantings that close to a structure because once they grow up, they're more likely to be um, pruned, removed, maintained, you know, um, cut back so that structures so it doesn't doesn't interfere with the deck or the house or anything like that. So that's not mitigation, correct? Well, it would be it would be restoration, Jamie, because they're removing that from that zone A of the salt marsh. So staff would prefer that it, you know, it went back somewhere near the marsh and not stuck between the house and the lawn area, where it would just become an ornamental planting area. Gotcha. Matt. Go ahead. These these are non-native plants that are, are essentially ornamental plants. Um, you know, um, I think that if we were to replant them, then perhaps we could uh, use some other type of, of plant of their choosing. Um, and then you end up with the same plant mass. Um, they really don't have hardly any value uh, at all. I mean, you can see in the pictures. Um, and we are reducing uh, lawn area and increasing plant mass substantially. Um, so just wanted to take, just wanted to get that out there and everybody take that into consideration, that's all. Well, Matt, again, yes, you are increasing the plant matter, uh, the, the planting on the property, but you're also increasing the, the square footage of the impervious surface on the property. So that's why it's not like, the, the applicants just doing this, you know, it, it's a requirement. Um, but I'll leave that up to the board. They can deliberate that if they'd like. Jamie, may I, may I make a comment? Yes, ma'am. So I don't mind if you get rid of the Ragosa Rose. That's not my favorite plant either. But that square footage should be added to the where the mitigation plantings are going to be with native plantings that you know where, where are you that you and Chris and and staff can work out as to what they are but I don't mind you swapping Ragosa Rose for something else it's just the square footage of where the Ragosa Rose is should be added to the A buffer okay. Anybody else have anything? All right. I'll move to close the hearing and take it under advice. Uh, I don't think we can close until we have a plan that shows what's going to happen. If I'll withdraw my motion. If it's a matter of adding some additional plant mass to the plantings, um, we can do that. We, we will do that. Uh, we would respectfully ask if you would allow this to close. We could submit a, a revised plan. We're already going to be meeting with staff on site to cite all of the mitigation plantings come time uh, for mitigation planting. Um, so it, it could be all taken care of together and you have a very capable staff. Well, we do. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't want to get into, because this is a really tight site, Matt, um, you know, Betsy just said they want it in the A buffer. You don't have a lot of room. So you're almost taking that Rugosa Rose out and putting a thin band uh, or another band of 
native shrubs exactly where that Rose River goes is going. I just don't see on the plan where else you would actually put it. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I don't want the staff to be in the situation where we're arguing in the field that this is where it's gonna go. Um, you know, you don't have room next to the house. I doubt you have 10 feet now. Um, so uh, yeah, you, you barely have 10 feet from where your mitigation is next to the house where um, it, this isn't mitigation planting, so though. We're, we're literally relocating or replanting. Betsy just said not. she would like them in the A buffer. It's vegetation. It's vegetation. It's vegetated. It's A buffer. We can add vegetation in A buffer, but they're not mitigation plantings. So you're going to put no, them right up buffers. against the house? Like, where are they going to go, Matt? That's what I'm saying. It's not like we have a lot of wiggle room. And I think what the board is saying is they'd like to see where it is that you're going to cite them. I'm not okay. saying they're called mitigation. They're going to be added. I don't know whether it's like a foot or two feet for your whole section of mitigation planning. So you can add them along there, but we just need to see where they're going to be. And Jen has to be comfortable before we close. So I did hear Betsy say that, and I believe Courtney. Is it, does everybody feel that way? Yes. It's a tough position to, to put on to staff to design the mitigation. We're not asking anybody to design in. Uh, we, 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 figure of speech, sorry. Um, I don't know. Well, um, you know, just to make another point too, the you know we invited um, conservation staff to be on site when we're planting because of their concerns about the shade tolerance. You know, you know, based on my experience, I'm I have quite a bit of experience of locating and selecting plants based on shade tolerance. So that was an invitation, just you know, to um, you know ease some of their concerns about where we would, we would be placing plants in relation to the light conditions on site. Uh, we weren't it's we weren't asking to, the, for their design you know it's not about the light conditions it's replacing the square footage that's being removed with square footage of native plants and if you look at the plan and matt if you want to share the screen again there's really not much not many places you can put it except where it already exists so the, the thought of putting it in between the lawn and the decks, you've just heard the commission's not going to accept that. So where else do we have? We have it over by, you, what, are you going to reduce the patio size? No, because that's going right up to the property line. Then if you look at the other side of the property, you know, you're within 10 feet of the house. And, um, you know, I just I just can't see. There's just no wiggle room on this site at all. So unless you just are going to verbally agree to put the, 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 the new native plants where the Rosa Ragosa currently exists, then I need to see where on, a, where on the plan you're proposing it. Cause I just can't visualize where are you gonna put it looking at this plan. Matt, is there a zone in the front, uh, you know, on the Can I? front yard? Yeah. Uh, there is a little bit. So um, let me share the screen for a second here. And can I ask you a question? Yeah. These are not mitigation plantings. So why couldn't they be included in the planting beds? Why couldn't we increase the planting bed sizes? Um, they don't necessarily need to be located uh, adjacent to native vegetation. I mean, they are, it's literally a couple of dilapidated hydrangeas and some Rosa rugosa. Um, I mean, if it's the plant mass you're concerned about, we could, we could fit some more mass in here. Um, Matt, do you mind if I, if I step in real quick? Sure. Please. Jen, they've met the mitigation footage, correct? Correct. So the, the Rosa Rugosa could go anywhere because there's ornamental at that point, no? Well, I mean, think about it. They're calling it ornamental. But it's, I mean, other people have used the term invasive and this board has always said that when you uh, in, remove invasive, that plant material has to be 
reestablished. That volume has to be reestablished in a native plant form. And it's usually, you know, in the general area where it's being removed. Um, this site is so tight, it's within the A buffer to the salt marsh. Yes, it 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 you know it's Rosa Rugosa, but we've heard both sides of the argument when it comes to Rosa Rugosa, depending on the site and depending on who's presenting. Um, and you know, unfortunately, you know, this isn't a site with a lot of wiggle room, like, oh yeah, we can work with staff to figure out where we're going to replace this. What, please, somebody on the commission, tell me where they're going to go. And now we're talking about the front yard in the fenced-in area where the dog is going to be. Well, it's uh, I mean, I mean usually the staff, Jamie, usually will, you know us, will work. I just don't know where you're going to put it. And it's going to, I can see it coming in the field that, it, you know, it's not going to be enough. And there's, you know, I just want to save, I just want it to be nice and clean. That's all. I mean, if, the, if Matt can get us a plan by next week, I mean, we have a hearing next week. If there's a plan that's submitted, you know, late late this week, I mean, it's a quick, it's a really quick review. I don't, I don't see why we couldn't just um, continue the hearing until the first to to get it settled. We can do that. That works for me. We just want to see the plan, Matt. Isn't there a space um, on the? Zone, I think I, I'm reading zone A to the coastal bank in the front yard um, on the outside of the dog area. It's being removed from the, the, the salt marsh zone A. Oh, you, you, okay, you wanted a salt marsh zone A, okay. Well, let's, all right, let's, let's, so let's be clear on what the parameters are here. So this is an ornamental, it's, it's non native. That we're going to be replanting. Does this need? Not an ornament. I mean, it's in, in, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is the the mitigation area. area that's proposed suffices. Does it or does it not? Regardless yeah. of the Rosa Rigosa. It does. What was that, Jamie? The mitigation area that's proposed, the square footage, correct. Meet, meets the standards, correct? For the expansion of the patio, correct. Okay. So why is the Rosa Rugosa even a concern? Because when you remove invasives or non-native species, like we've seen multiple times, the board never allows it to either be removed or that area to be used as mitigation. I mean, that's standard practice for this commission. It serves, it serves well, if, the function if, as a woody as a woody shrub it's not as good as native wood as shrubs but it serves the same functions but somebody planted these these are hydrangeas these aren't these aren't uh no, Matt, it's rosa rugosa it's a fairly big stand you took pictures of one hydrangea in there if it was hydrangeas i wouldn't be arguing come on just just continue the hearing and find a place to put them if it's if that's what you want to do i, I I really don't agree that they have to go into the zone A. It gives us more flexibility to increase the plant mass in zone B. Was that, would the board accept it's that? The goal is to have a vegetated zone A. You, you know that, Matt. I don't see why you can't add a line of shrubs just inland from your mitigation plantings, native shrubs, just add one extra shrub on each of the lines. And I think your area is gonna be the same as that Rosa Rugosa area. Yeah, Matt, I think we might be able to, that lawn area, you might, we might be able to ease it on the deck side in order to be able to pull the coastal bank side of the lawn just inward just enough so that we can increase that square footage by that amount potential. I think we can I think we can find something here. I 
I mean, Matt, we're not arguing when you're removing that like you or hedge right there. We're not requiring you to replace that material. So, I mean, this is this again, it's standard practice for this board. So All right. Matt, we'll Matt, request the continuance for a week. We'll submit a revised plan by the end of this week. Uh, so moved. Gladfelter. Heard second. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Uh, um, you can stop uh, sharing, please. All right. So we have a motion and a second on the table to continue this till 9 1. Is everyone clear what we're expecting? Final plan. I'm clear. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the motion on the table is to continue until 9 1. Betsy. Gladfelder, I. Courtney. Bird, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin? O'Brien, aye. Pat? Harris, aye. Peter? Walsh, aye. Steve? Pat and I. All right. It is unanimous. We have continued this until 9 1. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Night. Thank you. All right, next stop. I'm sorry, bear with me. Next up, we're gonna untable 86. So I would uh, entertain a motion and a second to that effect. I'll move, Gladfelter. Pat and second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to untable 86. Betsy. Gladfelter, I. Courtney. What happened to Courtney? Courtney, Courtney. you're on mute. You're walking away, Courtney. Come on, Court. Bird, I. <laughs> Matthews, I. Kevin. O'Brien, I. Pat. Harris, I. Peter. <laughs> Walsh, I. Steve. Pat and I. It is unanimous. We have untabled 86. All right. So for the record, because it's been a while now, this is a request for hearing under notice of intent. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, 86 Water Street, Woods Hole, Mass., for permission to replace the existing Iceland Marine facility at 86 Water Street in Woods Hole. The proposed work will involve A, the in-kind replacement of the existing pile supported dock, B, reconstruction and reconfiguration of the deteriorated bulkhead and small boat slips, C, installation of an autonomous vessel port, D, dredging along the facility's west berth, and E, site redevelopment including Demolition of the Iceland building and construction of a new waterfront building. Jen? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have promoted Jack Vaccaro up. Um, he is joined by Leslie Ann McGee, Eliza Cox, and Rob, I know I'm going to botch your name, Mirror. And Jack can introduce everybody. Jack, is that it for right now? Yes, it is, Jen. Okay. Um, thank you. And actually, we're. Um, Jack? Before you begin, I have to recuse myself. Can you can you put me in the other bin, please, Jen? Excuse Turn me. time out. Time out. I need I need to put Betsy in her bin. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Bets. Why aren't you leaving? Oh, <laughs> uh, Jack, thank you for letting us table you for a oh, little bit. Certainly understand. Um, we do, we do expect this uh, hearing will go on for an e uh, a while this evening and we'll, we'll run over to a few hearings, I'm sure. So um, more than happy to make the accommodation for you. Um, oh, we, thank you. We have a, a pretty well rehearsed presentation that we'd like to run through tonight to just provide the uh, introduction that's necessary for the commission. I know it was a large package that we, uh, we left with you a couple of weeks ago. And uh, 
what I'd like to do now is, is just turn the meeting over to Leslie Ann so that she can provide some introductory comments. And Jen, could you please allow Leslie Ann to share her screen so that she can drive the slide deck? I do believe she has that um, ability. So it should be all set. Okay, thank you. All yours, Leslie Ann. That wor is that working for everyone? Great. Yes, thank you. Yeah, beautiful bird's eye view. Here we go. Um, if it pleases you, Mr. Chair, may I proceed? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Leslie Ann McGee, and I am HUI's program manager for what we're terming this as the Seawater Project. In addition to my formal project management credentials, I'm also trained and educated as a marine scientist and have served as the Commonwealth's Coastal Zone Management Director in the past. Um, I believe, as does HUI, that we should be excellent stewards of our natural environment as well as good neighbors. We believe that as designed, uh, we are working towards meeting both of these goals. And we appreciate the opportunity to present our project to you this evening and look forward to a productive and collaborative relationship with the commission and its staff. Our team is at your disposal as you work through this very important process. I'd like to introduce the folks that are on the line tonight. Uh, we each are, have different roles in this quick presentation that we're going to give you. I just introduced myself. Um, Rob Munier is our Vice President of Marine Facilities and Operations at HUI, and he is going to give you um, some, a virtual site tour. Of course, we'll welcome you on site as well. I'm Jack Vaccaro, as you know well, is our Senior Consultant from Epsilon, has been working with us through our myriad of uh, regulatory processes. And then, of course, um, attorney Eliza Cox from Nutter, McClellan and Fish, who's worked with HUI uh, on a number of projects um, relating to the regulatory regime. And we, she will be available to direct um, and address any questions related to uh, the variance requests. So we do expect and we understand that the commission review of this project will likely take several hearings. Therefore, our goal tonight is really to condense the information in the NOI that we filed with you and all the associated plans and materials into a concise but thorough presentation that we hope will serve as a good introduction to the seawater project. To this end, we would really appreciate the opportunity to present the project in its condensed format in its entirety and answer your questions at the end, if at all possible. With that, I will turn it over to Rob Munier, and I'm gonna be running the slides. So Rob, I'll over to you. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. And Jennifer, it's Munir. So <laughs> sorry about that, sir. That's all right. I've been I've been called a lot worse. I can assure you. Uh, and thanks to the commission for considering our our NOI. And I also want to uh, shout out to the the team I have with me tonight, as well as all the folks that have been uh, working on this project as we've been developing our plans. Um, uh, Hui is the world's largest independent not for profit institution dedicated to basic ocean research. We work at the intersection of science, engineering operations and education to understand the ocean, inform the public, and provide solutions to meet challenges like climate change, energy, pollution, food security, and national defense. In the process, we advance ocean science and technology, we explore, we discover, and we get wet. Access to the sea is a fundamental resource for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In fact, it's our stock in trade. It's not just ships, although they're very important and will be for the foreseeable future. It's submersibles, it's robotic vehicles, it's small boats, it's sensors, it's observing systems and diving, which together enable our work. The Hui Waterfront has been providing Hui scientists, engineers, technicians, dive, divers, and seafarers access to the sea since our founding in 1930 at that site. It is essential infrastructure providing the interface for our creative practitioners between the lab, shop, and the ocean. There have been several iterations of our waterfront since 1930, each reflecting the needs and the technologies and available funds of their time. The current facility is called Islin, and it's named after Columbus Islin, who was a world-renowned oceanographer and Hui director in the 1940s and 50s. It was completed in 1969 and is now 52 years old. It is at the end of its engineering life. Maintenance costs are high and increasing. It has a patchwork of repairs and requires operational workarounds. It is suboptimal for what we do today, and it is vulnerable to sea level rise. 
For these reasons, it's time to create, to reimagine how we provide access to the sea at Hui for the rest of this century. We have initiated a redevelopment project called Seawater, complex for waterfront access to exploration and research. Our goal is to create a facility that meets current and future needs through 2100, focuses on prog programming that has to be on the waterfront, engages the broader oceanographic community, our neighbors and visitors, and is sustainable, especially with respect to sea level rise and our carbon footprint. Our waterfront is vulnerable to sea level rise. We've conducted extensive research to provide a basis of design for seawater so that it can be sustainable and adaptable. An outgrowth of our efforts is a partnership with the Marine Biological Laboratory and the National Marine Fisheries, our neighbors on Water Street, to examine the vulnerability of Woods Hole to sea level rise and develop strategies for mitigation, information that we are sharing with the community. Seawater is in the design phase. Much remains to be done, but we know enough to begin the regulatory process, which we have done with the NOI submission that you've got in front of you. For my remaining remarks, I'd like to take you on a brief virtual walking tour of Island. My goal is to provide some perspective, identify key features, demonstrate the challenges that we're facing, and provide context for Mr. Vaccaro's deeper dive into existing conditions at Island and our plans for seawater. So this slide uh, shows an aerial of, uh, and I'm gonna just walk you through it a little bit, starting uh, at the uh, back. We have two buildings, Bigelow and Smith. Those are really outside of this project. They face Water Street. So the project site itself is everything seaward of Smith and, uh, and uh, Bigelow towards the front of the picture. We have two major ship, uh, large ship berths, one we call the West Berth, and it's got the uh, Neil Armstrong shown there in the picture. And then the East Berth is on the other side and no ship in this picture. Um, we have a test well. The test well is a very important feature. It's where we test equipment, we put sensors, and we basically get uh, equipment ready to go to sea and, and do its business. In the, in the uh, shoreward side of the dock is the Island Building. Uh, and the Island Building contains shops, and uh, the marine operations operation. And behind that is a uh, lower building called the Smith Connector, which essentially is a building that was built to connect between the Smith building, the brick building in the background, and Island in the foreground. And to the right of the Island building is the Alvin High Bay. We're gonna show you a couple more pictures of that. It's named after the iconic submersible Alvin. And then we have some small boat slips that are on the uh, east side just in the Eel Pond Channel. Next slide, please. So starting uh, on the west side, uh, now we are looking seaward. Uh, so we're kind of in the corner where the Bigelow building is and where you go to MBL's property. We're looking uh, towards the south. And this is the area that uh, in this particular photograph is showing uh, what, we have, what we're doing today to get our autonomous vehicles, robot, underwater vehicles and, and robots deployed into either small boats or directly into the water for testing. So you can see it's kind of a, a collection of floats and whatnot that we use to get uh, those types of assets deployed and into the water. This picture was taken during a uh, uh, entrepreneurs forum and it shows the typical use that we have of our waterfront that uh, enables access by the public and by institutions really from around the world uh, to participate in what goes on at Hui. And the, the vessel uh, in this particular picture is the Atlantis and it's uh, birth at the, the west face and you're looking at the stern of the Atlantis. The Atlantis is the mothership of the album. Next slide, please. So same general spot, uh, this was uh, last week, uh, deploying a autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, the, the woman in the picture on the left there is uh, well known for her work with the shark cam. She's the one who invented and developed that. Uh, but again, it's a, a, a view of how we are now doing our business uh, along the west face to get some of these robotic vehicles in the water. And there's one of the small boats that we use that allow us to take those vehicles out, deploy them, test them, uh, and then bring them back for uh, refinement. And that vessel that's there is a, uh, a, a visiting vessel, not a, uh, a hui vessel. 
Um, and uh, it's another example of the type of uh, access that we provide. So it's not just for uh, hui operated ships, it's for visiting ships. Next slide, please. This is a view of the test well. Uh, this was uh, last week, and it's putting the autonomous vehicle sentry in for its testing, uh, getting ready to be deployed uh, at sea. And so this is a typical undertaking where we bring a vehicle down, put it in the test well, run it through its paces. You can see a container to the left of that crane. That's where we have sort of a, a laboratory. This is a uh, accumulated sort of set of assets. Uh, in the future, we'd like to have purpose-built type capabilities. And uh, the arrow on the, sh on the left from the aerial view shows the location of the current test well. And one of the modifications that we're proposing is to relocate the test well. And you'll see that in Jack's slides. Next slide, please. Test well, now we're looking uh, from the west berth back towards Island. Uh, this is another underwater vehicle. It's called Myriad Under Ice. It's designed to work under ice and actually uh, take measurements looking up at ice rather than down at the seafloor, which is the normal thing that a vehicle does. This happens to be during a visit we had from uh, Senator Markey and uh, the new Secretary of Commerce, uh, Gina Raimondo, who used to be the governor of Rhode Island. And this was on June 6th. Next slide, please. This is a drone view looking from the east, so towards the Dyer's Dock or the uh, Steamship Authority looking back towards the Island building and the uh, uh, brick uh, building to the right with the high bay door is what we call the Alvin High Bay. And in this particular picture, this was a year ago, April, we we're offloading the Alvin from the Atlantis to put it in the high bay for the purpose of doing a major year long refit. And, and that type of a resource, these high bay resources are critical for the, uh, the way we do business. In the background on the West Berth in this picture is the RV Neil Armstrong, which is the other uh, US Navy owned Woods Hole operated uh, large research vessel. Next slide, please. This is the Alvin in the high bay. You kind of get a sense, overhead crane, great working shop, an important asset and resource for us to provide uh, access to the sea. Next slide, please. This is a view, uh, front view uh, from the, from the uh, East Berth, looking back at the Island building. And um, I think we'll have a picture coming up, but one of the interesting attributes of this building is it straddles both the shore and the dock. So it is actually half on the dock. Uh, and uh, so hence, when we do a dock project, we have a building project. Next slide, please. This is another visiting vessel from uh, this afternoon be a commercial vessel that does uh, research uh, at our East Berth. Next slide, please. This slide shows the demarcation between land and sea. Uh, and it, that uh, concrete cap is really on top of the existing uh, seawall. To the right is land and to the left is dock. And you can see that that runs right through the center of the Island building. And in fact, goes right through the shop comes out the other side on the west face, and then there's a panhandle piece of our dock that goes towards the Water Street. Next slide, please. This is a view of our small boat uh, slips, and uh, you can see there's a wave screen there, and so this is just to the shoreward side of the east berth and uh, at the, uh, in the eel pond channel going into the uh, to the drawbridge there. Next slide, please. Another view of the small boat slip. And that's the Alvin High Bay in the background. And that the low building that I referred to in the first slide is called the uh, Smith Connector. So to the right, the brick building is uh, outside of this project. And the Smith Connector to the left is inside of this project. Next slide, please. Um, I spoke in my brief remarks about the fact that we have increased maintenance. These are examples of the type of activities we've been doing over the last uh, four or five years. Uh, and the left was a major repair done in 2019. 
On the right is an example of the kind of patchwork of repairs, which if you go, go to the dock, you'll see they're all over uh, the dock. And so basically this is a uh, interim fix to keep the concrete deck uh, functional. One other thing I wanna point out, just if you can go back to that slide, uh, Leslie Ann, uh, on the uh, upper part of the picture on the left, you see a notch, uh, the, with the way the bulkhead notches out and then goes back in. That's an, uh, one of the areas that we're gonna be making minor uh, adjustment to the overall configuration for the seawater project. Next slide, please. The other thing I wanted to point out was, uh, I mentioned sea level rise being critical. Uh, this was the winter storm Riley in 2018. It was a nor'easter. Nor'easters generally affect situate, you know, Falmouth is usually out of harm's way. And here we are relatively calm in the lee and yet uh, with a, a fairly significant tide. And we're seeing this more frequently. Next slide, please. So I guess to close and to be to hand it off to Jack, uh, this is a, a, an artist rendering of uh, what the site might look like when we've done the redevelopment uh, with a, a replacement dock, a replacement building that allows us to consolidate uh, that patchwork of, of buildings that we have into a, a single purpose built uh, building that's optimized for the site, for our needs and for the future to provide access to the city. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jack. Well, thanks, Rob, and uh, good evening, commissioners. For the record, I'm Jack Vaccaro, I'm senior consultant with Epsilon Consultants. Um, I'm going to begin my portion of this presentation by spending just a few minutes describing some of the unique structural elements of the site that affect the overall project design, uh, some of which you just heard from, from Rob, but they are important uh, items that I want to make sure you have a clear understanding of. So uh, next slide, please. The first thing you need to understand is that the dock area of the Island Marine facility consists of both pile supported and solid fill sections upon which various institution buildings are located. As this slide shows, the most seaward of these buildings, the Island Laboratory, straddles the bulkhead so that it's located partly upon the pile supported pier and partly landward of the solid fill bulkhead. As a result, in order to reconstruct the dock, the Island Laboratory must be demolished and replaced. And this provides Hui with the opportunity to re-envision the layout of the structures on the dock in a way that meets the institution's needs for the next 80 years. Next slide, please. The pile supported dock extends seaward from the bulkhead approximately 250 feet over Great Harbor. The dock provides wide berths for Hui's two global capable research vessels, the 238-foot RV Neil Armstrong and the 273-foot RV Atlantis, as well as the 60-foot RV Tioga and other smaller vessels. Next slide. The dock's reinforced concrete deck is at approximate elevation six and a half feet. Um, I just should just point out that all of the elevations I refer to during the presentation are in North American vertical datum of 1988. Uh, the deck is supported by 232 steel encased concrete piles. Most of the steel bulkhead is located beneath the pile supported dock or is supported by riprap embankment. The exposed portion of the bulkhead structure along, eel pond, along the eel pond entrance channel is cantilevered. And just pointing out again that this slide shows how the Island Laboratory extends out onto the pile supported dock beyond the bulkhead. Next slide. A chapter 91 license number 5153, which was issued in 1966, authorized all existing structures in flowed and historic tidelands and various improvements proposed at that time, including the installation of steel bulkheads and solid fill behind the bulkheads, construction of a pile supported pier, and dredging of a total of 8,000 cubic yards of sediments along the West Berth and at the Eel Pond entrance channel. Next slide. Access to exceptionally deep water right off the end of the dock is a unique and important quality of the site because it allows Hui scientists and engineers to test equipment at depth without leaving the dock. It also makes the site accessible to Hui's fleet of deep draft research vessels, as well as those visiting from other research organizations. 
Next slide. The wetland resource area is present at the site. It's fairly simple in this case. We have land under the ocean, which extends to the bulkhead, coastal bank at the bulkhead, and land the uh, landward of the of the bulkhead, land subject to coastal storm flowage. Next slide, please. Most of the site is within special flood hazard zone AE, elevation 12, as determined by FEMA, with the VE zone extending slightly inboard from the dock edge due to wave overwash. Next slide, please. Other sensitive environmental resources in the project area include eelgrass beds, priority habitat for rare species, and suitable shellfish habitat. An in-water video survey performed by CR Environmental on June 30th and July 1st, 2020 confirmed the presence of eelgrass meadows in the project area and accurately mapped their lateral extent. The eelgrass survey documented an estimated 5,800 square foot meadow on the western side of the Island Dock and a 15,000 square foot meadow on the eastern side within the eel pond entrance channel. The methods and results of the eelgrass survey are provided in the benthic survey report, which is included as an attachment to the notice of intent. The Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries has mapped suitable shellfish habitat within Eel Pond and a portion of the entrance channel near the northeast corner of the Island Marine Facility. You can see it on this graphic as that purple crosshatched area, which extends just south of the drawbridge. I should point out that as part of the benthic survey, CR Environmental also performed a shellfish survey along the western berth um, in that, yes, in that area of the site. And the results of that uh, survey are also included in the benthic survey report. And lastly, I just want to point out that there, there is priority habitat mapped over most of the watershed of Great Harbors. That's the uh, blue cross hatched area that you see. That does not extend onto the project site. It is approximately 100 feet seaward of the end of the dock uh, at its closest point. Next slide, please. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is proposing to replace the existing Island Marine facility with a more modern and resilient complex to serve anticipated needs through the 21st century. The project will include the demolition and reconstru reconstruction of the existing pile supported dock, reconstruction and reconfiguration of the deteriorated bulk bulkhead and small boat slips, replacement and improvement of the robotics port, dredging along the facility's west berth, and site redevelopment, including the demolition of existing buildings and construction of a new waterfront building. Next slide. The new dock will replace the existing dock in place and as a pile supported structure essentially within its existing footprint. Some modifications are proposed to enhance dock operations, improve vessel berthing positions, and facilitate vessel loading and unloading. These modifications include reconfiguring the bulkhead in the vicinity of the small boat slips along the eel pond entrance channel, improving the robotics port near the west berth to more efficiently launch and retrieve unmanned autonomous vessels and relocating the large test well to the most seaward end of the dock from its current location. Next slide, please. The project will provide a purpose-built robotics port directly north of the West Berth to replace the transient ladder and float system that is currently used for this purpose in the same general area of the dock. The improved robotics port will consist of a 16 foot by 42 foot hydraulic lift and two floating finger piers that will be accessed from a ramp. A steel sheet wave deflector and donut fender will protect the port from waves generated by southeasterly winds. Next slide. The proposed bulkhead reconfiguration removes the angular notch along the east side of the dock that projects into the eel pond entrance channel and requires the placement of 1,862 square feet of fill near the small boat slips. The reconfiguration is necessary to provide a space for RV Tioga to tie up along the eel pond entrance channel. The three existing small boat slips and wave deflector will be realigned as shown 
to accommodate the bulkhead reconfiguration. Next slide, please. The bulkhead and small boat slip reconfiguration will not adversely impact navigation in eel pond entrance channel. In fact, removal of the angular notch will significantly increase the minimum channel width at the end of Dyer's dock. Next slide, please. As part of the project, who we need to expand the previously authorized dredge limits and depths along the dock's west berth. Dredging in this area will extend slightly beyond previously authorized dredge limits and will increase depths to minus 24 feet at mean lower low water. The dredge volume, which is estimated to be approximately 420 cubic yards of sediment, will occur on approximately 4,850 square feet of the harbor bottom and largely within dredge limits previously authorized under the existing Chapter 91 license. Next slide, please. The project will also require the temporary removal and replacement of three to six foot diameter riprap boulders that are located directly adjacent to the existing bulkhead to install the new, the new steel bulkhead seaward of the existing bulkhead. The total volume of the riprap that will be temporarily removed and replaced for the new bulkhead installation is approximately 2,425 cubic yards. Because dredged material at this west berth, at the west berth will consist of both marine sediments and riprap boulders, dredge operations will be performed using a combination of clamshell and hydraulic dredge machinery accompanied by a container barge. Temporarily displaced riprap will be, re be replaced along the bulkhead as construction advances. All other dredge sediments will be discharged at an authorized upland site or at an approved landfill to be determined in consultation with DEP. This graphic um, is a high resolution um, image from some uh, sonar work that was done by one of Huey's contractors. And I like it because it really shows pretty clearly the boulders that have slumped down into the West Berth. And that's uh, necessitating a lot of the dredging work in that area of the project. Next slide, please. The primary purpose of the new waterfront building is to replace and right size existing facilities on Woods Hole waterfront campus that must come offline as part of the dock replacement. Three, the three story new waterfront building will be constructed entirely landward of the bulkhead and directly behind the Smith building where it will be located outside of the existing FEMA mapped velocity zone. It replaces buildings that are partially located within the velocity zone and within a footprint that is approximately 8,000 square feet smaller than the buildings being replaced. I should point out here also that the uh, gross square footage of the interior space of the new waterfront building is approximately 3,000 square feet smaller than the gross square foot of the buildings that are being replaced. Next slide, please. Bui has embraced the concept that the new facility should be built in an adaptable and forward-looking fashion that anticipates protect, projected sea level rise. Engagement with subject matter experts within the Hui community, coupled with modeling completed by external consultants, has provided a clearer understanding of the risks associated with sea level rise and climate change in Woods Hole, as well as reinforcing un uncertainty associated with long-range projections. The combined results of these analyses are reflected in the proposed site elevation, which set the base elevations for both the new dock and the high bays, that is the portions of the new waterfront building that are functionally dependent on the dock, at elevation nine feet, or, or two and a half feet above the existing dock elevation. The first floor elevation of the non-functionally dependent portion of the non-waterfront building will be at, at or above 13 feet. The dock and high bays are designed to be raised an additional one and a half feet in the future to accommodate, to accommodate sea level rise as needed. Next slide, please. Enhanced stormwater management is provided in the project design. A stormwater report and checklist was provided as an attachment to the notice of intent. It describes a comprehensive stormwater management system that will utilize landscape features to retain and infiltrate stormwater 
and will incorporate other best management practices to meet all of DEP's stormwater management standards that are applicable to this waterfront redevelopment project. Treatment of stormwater generated from the site will adhere to standard number four to reduce 80% of the average annual load of total suspended solids. As a result, the project will improve the quality of stormwater discharged to Great Harbor compared to the existing conditions. Next slide, please. The seawater project will require both temporary and permanent alterations to wetland resource areas. With respect to land under ocean, the demolition of the Island Dock will entail the removal of 246 steel piles of various diameters and installation of 89 new 36 inch steel piles to support the replacement dock. The use of fewer but wider diameter piles results in an increase in the bottom contact area of 333 square feet beneath the dock. An additional net increase of five square feet of pile contact results from the structures related to the, to the proposed dock modifications. Thus, the total net increase in pile contact area is 338 square feet within land under the ocean. The proposed bulkhead reconstruction and reconfiguration will result in the permanent fill of approximately 6,339 square feet of land under the ocean. This is partially offset by the removal of the angular notch in the bulkhead that currently projects into the eel pond entrance channel. That removal will restore approximately 814 square feet of previously filled land under the ocean. Thus, the net increase of fill within land under the ocean is approximately 5,525 square feet. A small boat slip reconfiguration at the eel pond entrance channel will increase the area of floats in this area by approximately 227 square feet. And the total area of floats and other structures associated with a robotics vehicle port is approximately 1,452 square feet. Dredging activities at the West Berth will impact an additional 4,850 square feet of harbor bottom. In total, the net alteration of land under the ocean from dredging and fill activities is approximately 10,370 square feet. And if we add the area of additional floats, you arrive at the figure that's on the slide here of 12,390 square feet. Next slide, please. The uh, Coastal Bank, again, in this case, the Coastal Bank is uh, armored for its entire length with a uh, steel bulkhead and seawall up at the uh, Northwest corner. Uh, the length of coastal bank uh, affected beneath the dock, 395 linear feet. The exposed section of bulkhead, uh, that is the section of the bulkhead that is uh, outside of the dock footprint, 95 linear feet along the east side and 260 linear feet on the west. So a total impact to coastal bank from uh, bulkhead reconstruction, 750 linear feet. Next slide, please. And lastly, on, uh, regarding impacts to land subject to coastal storm flowage, we have uh, figured a site disturbance of approximately 1.4 acres. And again, the building um, footprint is a, actually a, re a reduction of over 8,000 square feet in uh, area and uh, a little uh, 3,600 square feet of uh, reduction in terms of gross square footage. Next slide, please. Okay, we need to talk about the, the variance requests that are, are part of our application. The seawater project has been designed to minimize impacts to environmental resources and satisfies all performance standards that are prescribed under the Wetland, Wetland Protection Act regulations. But due to the unique characteristics of the site and nature of the proposed facilities, it cannot meet two performance standards established under the Falmouth Wetland Regulations. A detailed variance request has been submitted as an attachment to the notice of intent. And the requested variants are necessary to allow a portion of the new waterfront building to be located within the presumptive Falmouth B zone and to allow dock construction within 50 feet of mapped eelgrass habitat. Next slide, please. The new waterfront building will be located landward of the existing Federal Emergency Management Agency's mapped B zone which is a positive change from the existing condition where buildings extend into the VE zone. However, due to site constraints, the new waterfront building cannot be sited greater than 25 feet from the FEMA map V zone. 
since the Falmouth wetland regulation presumes the VE zone boundary is 25 feet landward of the FEMA map boundary, relief from regulation FWR 10.384D is requested to allow construction of the end of, of the new waterfront building within 25 feet of the existing FEMA mapped VE zone. Next slide, please. This shows, uh, this slide shows the areas of the existing buildings that are currently within the, the FEMA velocity zone, that's the red areas, and within 25 feet of the velocity of the FEMA velocity zone, that would be the yellow areas. And as you can see, we have about 4,200 square feet of structure within 25 feet of the uh, FEMA velocity zone, and another 729 square feet that has actually crossed the line into the velocity zone. Next slide, please. Here is a, a, a graphic showing the portion of the new waterfront building that's located with, within 25 feet of the currently mapped FEMA velocity zone, that yellow area, yes. It's a, a little under 1,500 square foot of, uh, of building footprint in, within the Falmouth presumptive D zone boundary. Next slide, please. To understand the extent of flooding for the proposed conditions, who we retain the Woods Hole Group to perform a floodplain analysis and calculate the extent of flooding across the site after the dock is raised by two and a half feet. The Woods Hole Group study indicates that in the future conditions, the higher dock elevation will serve a more effective vertical buffer to waves. Next slide. Based on the proposed future conditions with the dock elevation increased by two and a half feet, the Woods Hole Group model shows that the AE zone elevation will be reduced by one foot to elevation 11 feet and the V zone boundary will shift seaward to the edge of the dock. As such, the proposed new waterfront building will be located greater than 25 feet from the future V zone boundary. It's an important point here, and I just wanna you know, emphasize that it is anticipated that once the V zone at the site is adjusted to reflect future conditions, the project will eventually comply with the Falmouth wetland regulation with respect to the presumptive Falmouth V zone. Next slide, please. The project will also require dock and bulkhead reconstruction within 50 feet of eelgrass beds located to the east within the eel pond entrance channel and in shallow waters adjacent to the westerly edge of the dock. Relief from regulation FWR 10.161H5 is therefore requested to, be, to permit reconstruction of the dock within 50 feet of these eelgrass beds. Next slide. A draft eelgrass avoidance and protection plan was developed in consultation with the US Environmental Protection Agency, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, Falmouth Conservation Commission staff, and the Falmouth Harbor Master. And the project has developed specific best management pra practices that will be employed to minimize adverse effects on the known eelgrass habitat proximate to construction. This plan describes the strategies and measures proposed to avoid and minimize alteration to nearby eelgrass meadows and the mitigation to compensate for any unavoidable alteration. Next slide, please. Excuse me. An additional eelgrass survey will be performed to establish the lateral extent of eelgrass meadows immediately prior to the start of in-water construction activities. Once these areas are established, they will be marked with buoys to prevent unnecessary incursions by marine contractors. In addition, turbidity curtains will be deployed to prevent disturbed sediments from settling upon eelgrass plants. Subsequent post-construction surveys will document any areas of eelgrass that are adversely affected by construction and will monitor these areas for two to three years to observe any natural recovery. Given the proximity to the construction, it is assumed that some impact to eelgrass will occur and HUI is committed to providing effective mitigation for any such documented eelgrass impact. Next slide, please. The project's eelgrass mitigation strategy emphasizes the restoration of degraded eelgrass habitat by converting a specified number of moorings that use conventional tackle to conservation moorings which are designed to reduce eelgrass impacts that occur from conventional tackle 
dragging on the seabed. This image shows areas that have been mapped in great harbors uh, by DEP as having uh, healthy, healthy eelgrass meadows. It's interesting to point out that uh, the DEP was not aware of the eelgrass meadows in, in the eel pond entrance channel. And in fact, we were a little surprised ourselves at finding, uh, finding it in that area. Next slide, please. The green outline on this image shows the target area of interest for the project's eelgrass mitigation effort. Huey intends to recruit volunteer mooring owners within this area who would be willing to convert their gear at Huey's expense and then monitor the converted moorings to document recovery of eelgrass at each location. As currently proposed, up to eight moorings would be initially converted in order to proactively mitigate for the anticipated impacts to eelgrass. Additional moorings could be added in the event that um, it is determined through post-construction monitoring that it, it, it is uh, necessary. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the, the seawater project has been designed to address flood risks related to sea level rise and to minimize impacts to resource areas and environmentally sensitive habitats, in particular, the eelgrass meadows. Mitigation is proposed to address anticipated impacts to these resources. The project meets all performance standards that are applied under the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act regulations. However, due to the unique characteristics of the site and the nature of the proposed facilities, it cannot satisfy all, all performance standards applied under the Falmouth Wetland Regulation and variants from two specific regulations are necessary. The project meets the requirements for the issuance of the requested variances and who we therefore respectfully request that the Falmouth Conservation Commission grant the variances from the Falmouth Wetland Regulation and issues uh, permits to allow construction of the, uh, the new waterfront building and the seawater project. So next slide, please. With that, I think I would just uh, like to turn it back to the Conservation Commission. Thank you very much for your time. I apologize for being uh, so lengthy, but it is a, 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 you know, a lot going on with this project. So I hope my, uh, our presentation has been helpful. Thank you, Jack. All right. Um, anybody else on your, your group want to comment further before we go to, back to commissioners? Uh, Rob no, or Leslie? Sir. And we'll take that as a no. Jen? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, before we begin on questions, Jack, do you want to kind of go over um, when the commission might be able to see the site since you know, none of them were able to access the site. Yeah, of course. Um, Rob or Leslie Ann, would you like to address that question? Well, somebody. Well, like what I can say is that- um, who I've tried to unmute myself, I do apologize. Okay. Um, so we, we're available at your convenience for any of your individual commission members who would like to come and visit the site. Uh, I should say anytime, anytime there's daylight, we will welcome you to the site, weekends or regular work week. Okay, and who are they to contact? Would you prefer just the individual commissioners to, to contact? Um, or would you prefer like groups of two or three? Maybe we could coordinate small groups of commissioners to visit the site and get a tour. So um, what would be preferred? Either way is fine with us. I'll put my email in the chat and um, and we can coordinate that with you, Jen, and the commissioners. Okay. Steve, okay, did so you have a question to that? No, I uh, actually visited the site today and, and uh, was lucky enough to uh, receive a tour by uh, Kevin, Dave, and others. And uh, I, I was just totally mystified by the site. I had to see it for this hearing. But so thank those that supported me today and I apologize for intruding. Thank you. We're, we're glad you were able to do it and uh, fortunate that we had some folks there that were available. So that, was, that was great. Thank you for accommodating Steve. Uh, <laughs> and thank you, thank you, Leslie. So um, I'll get the commissioner's um, contact information and they can coordinate directly 
we, with you, we'll decide how we'll coordinate their their visits to the to the site because I think it's important as we move forward through this that they are able to see it. Yes, we had the um, Falmouth Town Planner out two weeks ago, and his assistant, and he said the same thing. It's you know, it's uh, it's one thing to see it in pictures; it's another thing to see it in person. Person. That was Steve's comments. Um. So just some of the staff preliminary comments. Uh, we sent that to you, Jack, a little late. Um, they're really kind of just basic for right now until, until we go in and dig more into this. Um, but obviously, as Jack pointed out, the we'll start with the building and move our way um, to, to the resource areas that currently as proposed, the waterfront building does not, um, as, as currently mapped, uh, meet those performance standards um, in the Falmouth Wetlands regs. We know you're asking for a variance, um, but we're just pointing that out. Now, just out of curiosity, Jack, the it's going to be the, the new waterfront building. Um, that's all, that's all marine orient, I mean, um, uh, water dependent uses the the, um, the the hui has done a, a real good job over the past couple of years in identifying the the operations that are ongoing at the waterfront and as um, uh, uh, identified certain functions that are absolutely necessary to be at the waterfront and so the idea here is that by by moving those operations that aren't essential to be on the waterfront to other locations, uh, either in, in Woodtoll Village or at, at Clark, they're able to uh, right-size this facility. In fact, uh, as I pointed out in the presentation, reduce the, the gross square footage and, and uh, footprint of the building for the uh, operations that are necessary to be right there at the site. So, oops. So all, all operations in that new building are 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 required for the the waterfront is what you're saying. Right, Rob. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, I I think uh, we've done a significant amount of programming work to determine what has to be on the water from the perspective of the types of things we do versus what can be moved. And in fact, we've just relocated our mooring and rigging shop from the current waterfront building to our new building on Pusset Campus. So a lot of work has been done to um, you know, make sure that the programming that's in the building has to be on the water. There's one, I don't know if I'd call it an exception, but we are contemplating having some public space, which would allow the public to view what happens at Woods Hole. And so some portion of the new waterfront building uh, as currently conceived is set aside for public space. I and guess I'd call that water dependent because the idea is for them to see uh, what goes on in Hui as a form of our communications of our mission. Well, the the the, the line of questioning um, is 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 driven by, you know, can the 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 building as designed um, could that be further? redesigned to kind of move some of that area that's within their um, offset um, either to a to another location in the building to maybe the front of the building or something like that but so that's where I was going with that um, and then you'll be redesigning the smaller docks I get the need for the um what are we calling it over here? The floating vehicle, the, the robotic, robotic vehicle robotic floating board. docks. So Jack, I have a question for you on that. What is the what is the current, the chapter, the old chapter 91 license was difficult to read. Um, what's the current approved dredging depth in that area? It's 22 feet mean lower low water. And you're going to 20 four correct in that area that is that darker gray on sheet g 102 the overall site plan that, that's right okay all right um and then 
there was another plan that we had the figure 1G and it showed some proposed dredge to chapter 91 limits and it was in a lighter blue and it doesn't look like it matches up to the darker gray on the G102 overall site plan. We're just a little confused at what those two areas mean. Um, apologize, I, I, I got the uh, staff report fairly late. I, so I, haven't, had, I haven't had a chance to, to look at figure 1G. Can you, um, can you direct No, that's me? fine. That's fine. Okay. The entire staff was in training all of last week, so we were kind of sure. Yeah, I didn't really well, get. I, I, I should say, Jen, that we do. We we will, of course, respond to uh, all comments we receive from the commission. And okay, so that was just one of the things. I can just kind of go over some of our comments and questions. They don't really need to be answered today or tonight. Um, just kind of putting some of them on the table right now. But we were just a little confused with Jack, and we can go over that with you at a later date, Jack. Um, so that was one, the building, I mean, basically it comes down to what the staff is concerned with is the building dredging, the impacts to ill grass, the reconstruction of the bulkhead. And I had a, I had a fifth one. I'm not thinking of it right now. Um, so it, it's pretty straightforward for for us, I mean, it's it's a large, complicated project, but our our issues can be boiled down to like five different sections. Um, so the bulkhead configuration, we're taking the the little um, bump out that Rob had described and shown in one of the earlier slides. We're taking that bump out, and when you describe dredging on the east side of the project. That's what you were referring to was the, the bump out that hundred, I mean, excuse me, that 814 square foot cut of the existing bulkhead, correct? That's, that's correct. All right. And then we're filling in that other one. And that your um you feel that there's no variance request uh needed from the CMR 10.25 or FWR 10.25 for that additional impact to land under ocean, you feel that you can overcome that presumption? We do, yes. Okay. All right. Um, and then again, we'd like a little bit more uh, clarification on the what's maintenance, what's improvement dredging. I guess, the again, that darker gray area on the overall site plan, that's the area going to 24 feet. In that's that, right. that that dredge footprint. Well, it 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 will there will be some sloping back out. I think the 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 polygon that's shown on the figure on the plans reflects the area of disturbance. So there is like in any dredging project, there's going to be a, a slope back up to meet the grades, yeah. right? So we're not going to 24 feet throughout that entire thank you. We're not going to, to 24 thank feet you. through that entire, but we are going to be establishing 24 feet. Certainly within the, uh, the 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 mooring area, the the berthing area, I should say. Okay, so that's just kind of the overall, and it's going to vary throughout that area. Correct. And it's all going to be south of that proposed um, wave deflector. Yes. Wave deflector. Thank you. It's a little dark in my back room here, so um, okay. And that's you. Um, you know, we're going to mirror G, uh, DMF's comments. There'll be obviously the time of year restriction. Um, and um, they had stated they want to see a revised eelgrass mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to see that in the order of conditions. So, um, well, I think I, I have not seen that letter, Jen. Um, Perhaps you can forward it on over. But the um, okay. what I read from staff, the staff report was that the DMF recommendation was that the uh, that there be a condition that the future eelgrass mitigation plan, because it is it is provided it really as a draft plan at this point. Um, it, it'll be negotiated out further with EPA through our core permitting, and we want to make sure that the the any revisions that result from that 
uh, subsequent review are, are captured in the uh, construction documents. So okay. I think the comment with, from DMF was that it wouldn't be revised in time for you to issue the order of conditions. They just wanted to make sure that any revisions that uh, are made subsequent to your review are, are brought back into the right. process. Right. Okay, we did receive that at one, around 140 this afternoon. I'll make sure I forward that to you, Jack. Thanks, Jen. I don't know why you're not on this email. Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, those are just some of the overall comments right now, Mr. Chairman, from the staff. Again, you know, once we get a little bit more into it, start digging into it a little bit more, we'll have more refined comments. Um, but that that pretty much sums up where we're heading, what we're looking at on the e each section, the dredging, the reconstruction of the bulkhead, um, the reconfigurations of the docks, um, and just the really true impacts to our wetland resources. So should we be expecting a, to use the word revised staff report after tonight's meeting? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure we'll have further comments and questions once Correct. Uh, we can do some site visits. Correct. Okay. Right, Mr. Newton, do you have anything to add at this time? No, Mr. Chairman, I don't think uh, I'm going to complicate things any further at the moment, but further down the line, I'm sure we'll have more comments. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see what we have for comments from commissioners to start with. Courtney, do you want to start? Sure. I'll, um, obviously, this is a large project and it has a lot to get your head around. Um, the one thing that I think we need to bear in mind is that this is this is the redevelopment of an existing site. Um, so I I think. In my view, um, um, some of the, because it is a redevelopment, the, we can look at this thing a little differently than if we were starting out with something uh, pristine and, uh, and the like. That's my only general comment. I just got to get my head around more of it. Yeah. Okay. All right, Peter. Uh, I agree with Courtney. Uh, it, it's a redevelopment, and I think we have to have some discussions later on, not uh, today, but uh, to uh, review some of the um, exceptions to the Falmouth Wetland Regulations. Kevin. You're on mute, even though I can see you. Here I am. Okay. Uh, no comments at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Pat? I have complete faith in our staff, but I also think due to the size and scope of this project, the complexity of some of the issues that are being raised, that we should talk about requiring peer review. Um, I personally think this is a perfect project for peer review, and I'd like to hear what other commissioners feel. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pat, could you repeat the end of what your comments were? I couldn't hear you. I'm, I apologize, I'll speak up. Um, the regulations allow us to require a peer review consultant when a project is as complex as this. And I would suggest that we do so. I, my, my initial comments for that is there's a whole lineup of consultants sitting here in front of us. They may represent the uh, petitioner, but uh, it's probably the world's best consultants at the moment. Um, the site is extremely complex. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to take a look at it. Um, I could not figure out what the dock could be when, and then realized it was, you know, 1,500 yards of concrete. 
um, and that was a dock. But uh, the impacts and and Mrs. Bumpus's uh, letters are, are uh, I think, interesting. To, uh, the impact on the uh, local community during construction, and uh, of course, um, navigation for other vehicles not related to uh, your facility. Um, I think Jen has a good handle on what the impacts will be. Um, but those other issues, I think, are ones that I'd like to uh, make sure we stay on top of as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Jack or Rob, but um, the buildings are going to become smaller. And I believe you said that uh, some of the facilities can be moved off site. Did I understand that correctly? Some that are less water dependent, I think was the phrase you used. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Jenna, let's um, see what we have for chat. Public comments, please. There's no public comment at this point, Mr. Chairman. It's amazing. If I'm missing something, I don't see anybody's, oh, I have an attendee's hand raised. Okay, let me just say, um, you know, to the public that this is one of those hearings that is not gonna close tonight. So um, there's gonna be other opportunities and the letters we received, everybody got copies from, um, from Catherine Bumpus. So obviously we would do our diligence in, in looking at all that. So there will be more opportunities as well. So anybody watching, don't feel if you've missed your opportunity, you, you really haven't. Okay. So Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna promote Catherine Bumpus to, um, to a panelist, I think I just did. Okay. It's always on a delay. Either that or I just lost her. Nope, here she is. Catherine, you've been promoted to a panelist. Thank you, Jen. I'm sorry, I'm actually a far away on vacation in Maine. Um, so it's very handy that I can join you via Zoom. Um, I would say that I appreciate Pat's comment about the possibility of a peer review. I think this is a very complicated process, a very complicated project. I've looked through the filing fairly thoroughly um, and think that it deserves a, a very hard look. I think that Huey is intent on doing a good job, but that doesn't mean that they don't need to have um, the oversight, even though it's a redevelopment project. And we've seen other large projects in town that would have benefited from very thorough looking at in the permitting process. So there are many moving pieces to this. Jen, you came up with five of them quite quickly. So I think doing a whole overview would be helpful for you to have others to support your review of this. Um, I know that there will be lots of public comment because the public is just becoming aware of the project. And this is the first time that the plans have been shown and it's been laid out the way it was this evening for people. Right. Thank you, Catherine. Um, also, uh, just for the public that any comments that could be sent in ahead of time, so a letter, email, what have you, uh, is helpful too, because um, then we all have a chance to review all the all the comments and, and in theory address everything. Right. Are there any other comments? Public chat, Jim. No, Mr. Chairman, not at this okay. time. All right. So I'm thinking we want two things tonight um, that we'll be looking for is one um, at Pat's suggestion, and I don't say I disagree with it. Um, do we want to initiate the peer review sooner than later? 
if we're going to go that route. So I think I'm going to be looking for a motion and then a vote of whether we want to request um, the peer review. And um, may I just jump in for the commission, Mr. Chairman, just to let the commission know that the town is moving into the direction of requiring um, peer reviews for very large scale projects such as this project. The ZBA has taken the stance that any large scale housing project such as a 40B automatically is subject to a peer review. So if this commission has some concerns with going that route, it's it's kind of the direction the town is, is, is kind of, certain boards are moving into to assist um, with a, a thorough review, assist the staff with um, coming up with conditions. Um, so it, it, it is, um, it is happening in the town on other review boards. I'd also like to note that it's happened with the commission in the past as well. The commission has on other occasions um, engaged peer review for complicated projects. Yeah, and I don't think it's a bad reflection on, on present company. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of experts involved in this. And I, I just think somebody for our perspective is, is helpful. Right, absolutely so, not a negative um, statement about the applicants at all. It's just to help and guide us um, for uh, another analysis coming from the outside. And this is a large project, complicated project. It puts an unnecessary burden on our staff. They do a lot of work already and this could help them out as well. Um. I agree. I, 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 it makes sense on the, just from the scope of it um, to have um, um, you know uh, another set of eyes, particularly not necessarily hired guns from the applicant. And that's not to say they're not you know they're not competent or or anything, but I think it, it, a second opinion is important. All right, so uh, is everybody clear on that? Okay, so I'm gonna be looking for a motion. Jack? Um, I, 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 I just would feel, uh, well, I, I'd like to just express uh, my point of view on this, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Not at the, all. Um, so it, it is true that, um, that, that who he has engaged a, a pretty uh, impressive group of of architects and engineers uh, to support this project. Um, it's also true that while while this is a certainly a, a large project within the context of the, the village of Woods Hole, the Conservation Commission's review on this is is fairly straightforward. It's uh, the five you know the five areas that that Jen mentioned. We we have uh, specific regulations and specific requirements, and I I believe that between staff and this commission, you're more than capable of, of exercising your responsibility here. Uh, I understand it's your prerogative. If you feel it's necessary to hire uh, a third party review, then you know certainly, uh, but it, it just, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would ask this, give us an opportunity to provide you with the information you need first. And if you feel still that a third party consultation is necessary, then do it then. I, I, I think you'll be impressed as we work through this process that there's quite a lot of information that we're prepared to provide to you. Um, so I, I just ask you to consider that in, uh, in, in making your decision with respect to this. Fair enough, Courtney. Um, I certainly understand Jack's um, point of view on this. And, and you know, I think, I would assume that that um, Huey's objective is to, you know, this is a very complicated project to um, to uh, permit and and so on, and I'm sure you budgeted a fair amount of time for it. But um, you know, at the same time, I think if the um, uh, commission were to um, retain a consultant. Um, at this stage of the game, it might actually facilitate things. 
um, from the standpoint of getting getting us through the process. Um, the other thing I think is my experience with um, when we've had consultants in the past is that oftentimes what happens is that um, the consultants that get hired often frequently confirm the the applicants. Um, um, arguments and points of view. So I don't see it necessarily that this should be an adversarial kind of a relationship. I think one of the biggest benefits is when it comes down to the conditions, order conditions. So, well, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna take a vote, see where it lands, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So um, I would entertain a motion in a second to um, initiate a peer review. So moved. Bird second. Okay, so the motion and the second on the table is to initiate peer review. Um, I'm just going to take a vote, see what happens. Courtney. Bird, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter? Walsh, aye. Steve? And no. Okay. So it's 5 1. So that passes. Um, so we would be initiating a peer review. Jen, I assume you can get that rolling. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. The second thing we'll be looking for, I believe at this point, if there's no further comments, questions, um, is um, Jack, what is your position on this as far as uh, continuance goes? We would like to continue to September 15th if you're meeting that evening. We are. We are meeting that evening. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will not be here on the 15th. Um, I'll be here on the 22nd. Um, also, that'll just give me a little bit more time to kind of um, square away the, 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 the peer review and, um, can, you know, communicate with Jack on that, um, get the materials to, um, you know, work with the board, get the materials to someone, um, Jack, would the 22nd be okay for you the week later? Rob, how does that work for your schedule? Um, you know, it's. I'm sorry, no, it doesn't work for me, Jen. I'm. I'll be on vacation that week. Okay. Um, how busy are we on the fifteenth? Because that's the other thing is, you know, as this gets, you know, closer and closer, there's going to be more, more commenting, I imagine. No, I had it right in front of me, Mr. Chairman, and then it went flying somewhere. Hang on. Well, right now we don't really, we have three continued notices. We don't have any new notices continued. Okay, so I mean, so we could do the 15th, and if nothing else, it gets any new, I don't know, questions. <clears throat> Any new addressed. comments or questions that come in from the public, we can we can well, get from us because if we, you know once we do our site visit, mm -hmm. you know, except for Steve, of course. But you know, so all right. So, so Jack, is that an official request, sir? Uh, yes, continue? yes, Mr. Chairman. If we could continue, you. you know, I got to follow protocol, right? All right. So we have a request from the applicant to continue this till nine fifteen. I'm Bird. looking for a motion and a second. Bird, so move. Pat and second. second. All right, we have a motion and a second to continue this till 9.15. Um, Courtney. Bird, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Pat and aye. All right. It is unanimous. We've continued this hearing until September 15th. Thank Mr. you, Jack. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Leslie. Chairman. Thank you, Rob. 
Mr. Chairman, before we before we leave this a housekeeping thing, how is it left on the site visits? Is the are we going to coordinate so that everybody that we get as like large groups of us or rather than just well, individually? Yeah, we can do it either way. There can only be three of us, so it can't be a uh, a public meeting. Um, well, so if you guys that want, would be more efficient in my view is to have two. I, in quorum problems, to, Courtney. Huh? Everybody talk at once. Quorum problems. What's so that? Courtney, yeah, we can coordinate so that there's two or three of us and then there's only two separate visits. Yeah, that's what I was. So we'll that'll get coordinated through our We office. can work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then one of us can I'll reach out to Leslie and, and we'll coordinate um, a time and a perfect to do that. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Yeah, okay, and thank well, you, everyone. Well, thank you all, commissioners. Uh, thank we'll you. see you on the 15th. Thank you. All right. I have to say, I should have said it while, while they were all on. I hope they're still listening. That, that was very concise. I thought that was very well done. It was. Just, just to say it, I mean. All right, moving on. Continued hearings have already been addressed. Next up, request to extend the existing order conditions. First up, excuse me, Mullen Inc., 267 Clinton Ave, LLC. 267 Clinton Ave, Falmouth, Mass. DEP number 25-4020, requesting a three-year extension. Yes, Mr. And Chairman. We're gonna see, we're gonna see a few of these where we where we extended them during um during COVID and 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 those were kind of invalid. The the COVID the, the order basically froze all of the all of the permits during the COVID emergency. So when the emergency ended. We are adding 462 days onto each permit. Um, so some of the permits we did earlier in the year are, are coming up for, or in the early days of COVID are, are coming up to expire. And the two that you're seeing tonight are a perfect example. So um, technically this is the um, a th a three-year time extension. Um, this has to do with a beach nourishment project um, over down by the Tides Motel. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's where this one is. And, oop, I gotta let Betsy back in. I don't know where Betsy went. Hang on. Hang on. She's locked out of the internet right now, so that's why I don't see her. And I thought I forgot about her. She apparently locked herself out of the internet, so I don't know how that happens. Um, so this was a three-year, um, but they still would only be able to put that certain amount of beach nourishment in. Now, you just denied an extension for... Uh, I think it was the white sands because they wanted to extend a a permit with beach nourishment. Um, so I think this falls in the same in the same category. Um, I would barely got extra time just because of COVID, correct? Correct. But in theory, they couldn't get the help. Property, yeah. I will say that this particular property has changed hands three times. Um, it changed hands. It was owned by one owner. They sold it about, I'd say, six to eight months after they bought it. The gentleman that we recently um, had to remind them that they had an order of conditions has again sold the property again. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, doing a one-year time um, extension so they can kind of regroup, but I think three years is a little too long. I'd like to, to see a new notice with the new owner so they fully understand the process and, and any conditions that are attached. I agree. Okay. 
And they can always <clears throat> come back in a year and apply again. Correct. Exactly. Correct. All right, so I'll be looking for a motion and a second to grant a one-year extension. So, so moved. moved. Seconded, Harris. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second to grant a one-year extension. Courtney? Bird, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin? O'Brien, aye. Pat? Harris, aye. Peter? Walsh, aye. Steve? Pat and I. All right, it is unanimous. We have granted a one-year extension. Next up, Robert Richards, 45 <clears throat> Little Neck Bars Road, Falmouth, Mass, DEP number 25, 4292, requesting a one-year extension. Jen? Again, it's the same scenario, Mr. Chairman, so I would recommend a one-year extension on this one. This is due to expire October 8th, so it would be extending to October 8th of 2022. Heard so move. Harris, second. Way ahead of time. I like that. There's so much confusion between different boards, different consultants about what, what's going on with extensions and yeah. Well, unprecedented times, right? Yeah. All right, Courtney. Heard I'm aye. sorry. The, the motion in the second is for one year extension. Bird, aye. Thank you. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Harris, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. At night. As unanimous, we have granted a one year extension. Next up are or is vote order of conditions. First up, Hamlin Homes, 89 Beach Street, East Falmouth, Mass. Quorum. One second, Mr. Chairman. That fell on the floor. <laughs> Um, raise and rebuild. So basically raising the existing house, proposing new house, not moving any place closer. Um, I think one of our issues on this during the staff report was um, there was an old enforcement order on of this to address a non-compliance issues from DEP 25 137, so that was sometime in the 70s um, or early 80s, um, but they did, they were required to restore the buffer, and you can see from the plan that there's a section of the buffer that, that has been removed. It's kind of all mulch and ornamental grasses, and our only um, special condition would special conditions would to be related to um, restoring that area to that buffer as required in that original order of conditions and as required in the enforcement order that was back in 2000, I wanna say 10-ish around there, um, 11, 2011, um, to kind of reestablish that buffer. All right. So that was two points, right? To conform to the original order condition, well, enforcement order and replant that buffer, correct? Correct. I'm just looking at my notes, that's why. And then relocate a tree away from the driveway? Yes, relocate that tree because it's- um, Proposed, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's under a, a, a pretty shaded canopy. All right, does there, anybody have anything? Is there any issue with that irrigation? We is that a standard thing now that we allow temporary uh, irrigation? It'll be a, it'll be a temporary irrigation. I don't see that they have a, that there is a um, an existing irrigation on site, Courtney. Okay. I have a note Here. about removing a shed. Uh, Why not? The shed's being moved. All right. Uh, Parking space. I think it's being eliminated. 
Let me see the shed on the plan. You yeah. asked that specific question. It's on the neighbor's property, that's why. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter? Uh, did Jen receive a new re plan revision? Not yet. No, I have not. Wasn't what were you expecting on that? Where are my notes? Um, I want to see the shed now. Peter, what were we want? What did we want on that plan revision? We were talking about Harbor Avenue being. Um, Well, I'm not sure, but I, I think the prior commissioner's comments covered that the, okay. the, the proposed tree out of the shade, yep. no planting requirements, and uh, compliance with prior order of conditions. Correct. But, uh, I, I thought that he was supposed to have a uh, new plan revision. We can require that he submitted a new plan depicting those those things um, prior to planting, prior to reestablishing that buffer, and prior to us signing off on the building um, permit um, application. We can require that new plan showing the reestablishment of that buffer. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody have anything else? I'll, Other uh, than move, standard stuff? I'll, I'll move to accept the order. As discussed. Our second. All right, so we have a motion and a second to issue an order of conditions as discussed. Courtney. Heard, aye. Matthews, aye. Kevin. O'Brien, aye. Pat. Sarah, aye. Peter. Walsh, aye. Steve. Pat and I. It is unanimous. We have issued an order of conditions. We got to be close to done. My pen just ran out of ink. We just have other business. Yeah. No, I just wanted to let you guys know since I wasn't I wasn't here when this was voted. Um, there was a, a DEP on site regarding your um, positive motion. I mean, your positive determination for that gate that you received a number of letters on. Um, there was a, a DEP site visit, we did go through that, met with DEP. Um, DEP did issue a superseding order allowing that gate to proceed under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, I just didn't, I wanted to make the board aware just because of the sheer volume of public uh, uh, input that you got on that, as well as wondering, I mean, this still has to go to Barnstable Superior Court under our bylaw, but I did not know if the board wanted to appeal um, DEP's superseding determination. Remind me, what, the pro what was the project? The gate hey, from uh, the bike okay. path. Yeah, yeah. To Little Neck Barger. Okay. Yeah, and we we found think that, that indeed um, there was an environmental impact because it was within the resource areas. Do we feel that we're on pretty good ground? And if so, I, why shouldn't we appeal it? Well, Courtney, typically um, in the past, the commission hasn't been aggressive about appealing the DEP superseding order because our regulations are more restrictive and allow um, the determination to rest with the superior court on an appeal under the bylaw. Why um, push town council's office to litigate on two fronts? Superior court is more favorable to us because our oh, regulations okay. are at play. So we don't need to, so. I don't so, think so. Well, I guess, help me understand this then it's automatically appealed? Is that what you're saying? No, no, they need to file um, an appeal in the Superior Court, but they have a longer window to do that. And I don't know if, there's a, have you heard, Jen, whether they filed an appeal to the Superior they Court? They have filed the appeals. So Courtney, okay. 
just to explain to the commission, uh, some of you that don't work with this every day, like this staff does, when a, so you, when Jamie starts a meeting, he goes through his blurb that we're reviewing cases um, and we're reviewing him under the wetland, two authorities, the Wetlands Protection Act, which is a state regulation, and the state gives this board the authority to review under the Wetlands Protection Act on the Falmouth Local Wetlands Bylaw, which is our own town bylaw. When a order of conditions or an RDA or something is appealed, that appeal process splits. The appeal to under the Wetlands Protection Act goes directly to DEP, and the appeal under the bylaw goes to Barnstable Superior Court because DEP has no authority over, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Pat, but I'm not, um, the DEP has no authority over the town's local wetlands bylaws. So the only appealing, um, so under the bylaw, they have to appeal it to the Superior Court, Courtney. They can have one, but they can't go through the project unless they have both. So right now they have the permission and authority to construct a gate under the Wetlands Protection Act, but they still don't have the permission from Superior Court. So they can't go forward with the project right now. But they they've applied for that, correct? What was that, Jamie? But they've applied for that, correct? Yes, they have. We have okay. prepared the administrative record. We have submitted it to town council's office. So town council will be appearing in superior court on our behalf. Okay. okay. That clarifies that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so there's no action required on our part at this time. No. And, and no, unless you want to appeal it. I just knew there was a real, a lot of public pressure on the board. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention and see what you wanted to do with it. No, uh, that's probably the best venue is letting it roll. Okay, perfect. Works I mean, do you me. guys agree? I'm, I'm not. Yes, I do. No, I'm fine with that. I just, now that I understand the process. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Okay. Um, just on other business real quick. Courtney, I'm not going to be here next week. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put together um, my paperwork junk and you, can't you get it script? on the camera. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, okay. I'll, I'll put it in your uh, mailbox at Okay. In Amy's office. So, and you don't have to use it, but just so you know what I. Um, or if you want, you can just email it to me. Okay. Either way or both. Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. You can shred it. That on way I can don't like it. I get a chance to rehearse it. Yeah. All right. That's it. No more other business. Then I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. that. Uh -huh. <laughs> everybody's quick on that motion all right we have a motion and a second to adjourn courtney bird eye matthew's eye kevin o'brien eye pat harris eye peter walsh eye steve hi it is unanimous we are adjourned thank you Kristen.